Hi, this is Chris Altrock, and this is abbreviated content of a class presented at the Stanford Church of Christ on October 23rd, 2022. This is part of an ongoing series in the book of Jeremiah. In this session, we take up Jeremiah chapters 21 through 24. We'll just hit some highlights, and then we'll meditate on one particular section regarding fruit. So overall, there are uh, four major things that Jeremiah does in this section. Number one, he talks about how God opposes the leaders of Judah. And so he makes a pronouncement to King Zedekiah in Jeremiah 21, verses 3 through 7. He announces that the people of Jeremiah would die of famine, pestilence, or the sword. Many would be taken to Babylon. King Zedekiah and his officers would be handed over to Nebuchadnezzar and judged. And that is indeed what happened. Then he makes a pronouncement to the people in verses 8 through 10. There was no hope for the king, but there was hope for the people if they would surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Then he makes a pronouncement to the house of David, verses 11 through 14. He speaks to David's dynasty, the kings who sat on the throne because of God's covenant with David. If they obeyed God's law and executed justice, God would keep his promise and maintain their royal dynasty. But if they disobeyed, even they would lose their right to the throne. Second, Jeremiah in this section talks about how God discloses the fate of the kings. This is Jeremiah 22 through the first part of Jeremiah 23. So Jehoahaz or Shalom, who succeeded Josiah and reigned only three months, is deported by Pharaoh Necho to Egypt where he dies. Jehoiakim, also called Eliakim, reigns for 11 years and then dies in Jerusalem. He's followed by Jehoiachin, also called Jeconiah or Kaniah. His reign lasts three months. He's taken to Babylon, where eventually he dies. God discloses the fate of the kings in, in terms of talking about the last king of Judah, Zedekiah, who reigns for 11 years, sees the uh, kingdom and the city of Jerusalem destroyed by Babylon. He is blinded and taken to Babylon to die. Then Jeremiah talks about how God exposes the sins of the false prophets. This is Jeremiah chapter 23. So Jeremiah talks about their disgraceful conduct in verses 9 through 15. Then he talks about their dishonest message in verses 16 through 32. Then he talks about their disrespectful attitude in, chapter, in uh, verses 33 through 40. And then fourth, in this large sec section, Jeremiah talks about how God disposes his rebellious people. This is Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 10. God gives him a, a vision of two baskets of figs sitting before the temple Lord. One basket holds good figs, the other holds bad figs. And God explains to Jeremiah that the good figs represent the exiles who've been taken into Babylon. The bad figs represent King Zedekiah, his officials, and others who remained in the land or who had fled to Egypt. Let me just note here in Jeremiah chapter 22, one particular place where God reveals to Jeremiah the kinds of disobedience that had brought this great judgment upon the people. And, and notice the, the social justice uh, focus in this text. Jeremiah 22, beginning verse 1, thus says the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, sitting on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates, Thus says the Lord, act with justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the alien, the orphan and the widow or shed innocent blood in this place. For if you will indeed obey this word, then through the gates of this house shall enter kings who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they, their servants and their people. But if you do not heed these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house should become a desolation. And it's an interesting window into what exactly had sparked the, the anger of God and, and the displeasure of God with the people in Jerusalem. And here we see that it has to do with the way they have rejected, ignored, neglected, 
uh, marginalized uh, the alien, the orphan, the widow, those who have been uh, victims of unjust violence and acts of aggression. It's the poor, it's the marginalized, it's those who dwell on the exteriors of society and the way in which they have been completely ignored or willfully harmed that have earned God's judgment on this place. Notice this promise that God makes in Jeremiah 23. Again, this large section, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where they've been driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall no longer fear or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. Even in the midst of this terrible time in the lives of the people of God, as Babylon comes south to destroy Jerusalem and take the people into exile, even in the midst of what could hardly be uh, any worse, we have this promise of God, that God will be a shepherd to them, that he will tend to them, he will take care of them, and he will provide for them. It's an important image to hold on to. Now, sort of an overview. Now let's just sit with this image that God gives Jeremiah in Jeremiah 24, the image of the good figs and the bad figs. And let's explore a little bit the image of fruitfulness in Scripture. So Jeremiah 24, verse 1, The Lord showed me two baskets of figs, placed before the temple of the Lord. This was after King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had taken into exile from Jerusalem King Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim of Judah, together with the officials of Judah, the artisans and the smiths, and had bought them, brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs, but the other basket had very bad figs, so bad they could not be eaten. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I said, figs, the good figs, very good, and the bad figs, very bad, so bad they cannot be eaten. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. For they will return to me with their whole heart. But thus says the Lord, like the bad figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten, so will I treat King Zedekiah of Judah, his officials, the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in the land and those who live in the land of Egypt. I will make them a horror, an evil thing, to all the kingdoms of the earth, a, a disgrace, a byword, a taunt, and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. And I will send sword, famine, and pestilence upon them until they are utterly destroyed from the land that I gave to them and their ancestors. Let's just meditate a bit on this image of fruitfulness, the good figs and the bad figs. So first, the good figs. At least four thoughts here. Number one, even in a bad place, you can be fruitful. So this exile to Babylon from Jerusalem, from the nation of Judah, was the worst conceivable situation in Jewish history from this moment forward. The Jewish people would look upon this exile as one of the lowest moments in the lives of their people, one of the worst circumstances they had ever endured. And yet even in the midst of that, God promises them that they are good fruit. They can be fruitful. 
And what a comforting promise that is for you. Even if you this very day find yourself in difficult circumstances, the promise is that even in a bad place, you can bear good fruit. Number two, your capacity to be fruitful can remain even as other things change. And so the, the people receiving this message from Jeremiah are in a process of change. The exiles would be sent to Babylon. They would live in Babylon, then they would be sent back to Judah. And yet even as these circumstances were changing, moving from one location to another, they remained good fruit. And so it's, it's not just a statement about bearing fruit in bad circumstances. It's a statement about bearing fruit in changing circumstances. Even if you right now are in the midst of, of a season of change, the promise is that even in that change, your ability to be fruitful, productive, to make a difference remains. Number three, God works to sustain our fruitfulness. The promise is that, that God will build us up. God will plant us, even in the midst of circumstances that, that might cause us to doubt God. You can trust that no matter what situation you find yourself in today, God is at work. He is building you up. He is planting you. He's providing you what you need so that you can be fruitful, productive, so that you can contribute to the lives of the people around you. And number four, a genuine and authentic relationship with God, which is the source of all true fruitfulness, is possible even in harsh circumstances. So God promises here to, to give the people a heart to know him, to make them his people. And these promises are made to us as well. We can trust that God is at work, deepening our relationship with him, our connection to him, so that we can bear even more fruit. A couple of reflections on the bad figs. So even in a good place, you can, be fruit, you can become fruitless. Because the people who were called bad figs were the ones that were still in Jerusalem, the, the holy city. And yet even in that good place, God called them fruitless. You might finally get to that place you've always longed to be in in your life. And yet, even in that good place, it's possible, possible to be fruitless. Second, even as a person of privilege and power, you can become fruitless. The bad figs included royalty, the king, and those in his administration, those who had privilege and power in that society. Just because you gain privilege and power does not automatically mean that you will be fruitful. So let's step outside of that text and look at a few other texts that talk about the idea of fruit and fruitfulness. So this beautiful text in Psalm 1, notice this promise, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. All that they do, they prosper. Here is a beautiful promise of fruitfulness, that as you stay connected to God, delighting in the law of of the Lord. You become like a tree planted by streams of water. And, and no matter what else is going on in your life, no matter what circumstance you're in, what season you're in, you remain planted in that stream of water, which is God. And so you yield fruit and your leaves do not wither and you prosper. I want to invite you to just sit with that image and listen to this psalm taken directly from Psalm 1. <laughs> joy 
the joy, the joy of those who delight in the law of the Lord. Oh, the joy, the joy, the joy of those who meditate day and night in the law. Consider also these words from Jesus in John 15 about fruit and fruitfulness. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. I invite you now to listen to this brief clip of Francis Chan talking about this text in John 15 and the inability to bear fruit apart from abiding and the ability to bear fruit through abiding. So Jesus makes it clear that if I'm not connected to him, I am guaranteed no fruit. He, he says it very clearly. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself 
unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I brought a branch. Look, if we all work together, do you think we could make this branch bear fruit? No, it's, I mean, you could tape like an apple to it or something, you know, and make it look like, oh, no, 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 look, look. And I feel like we do this sometimes. We work so hard, but man, this branch has, it's got no chance. Okay, he can try like, mm, mm, you know, like nothing, nothing's going to happen. And Jesus says, that's how ridiculous you look when you're not with me. You're not abiding in me. And you're just out working. You're going to labor in vain. You're going to try all this stuff and you're going to think and you're going to talk to all these people with all these different strategies. But I promise you, if you're not abiding in me, you're not going to have any fruit that lasts. No real fruit's going to happen. So everything Everything depends on this. But then he says in the very next verse, he goes, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. So then there's a guarantee. Okay, see, this is what I'm saying. Don't stress out about all these other things. Jesus Christ, I mean, these were his words. He guarantees He says, if you abide in me, he is the one that's going to bear much fruit. Look, I struggle with this. I'll see people on the earth doing amazing things, and I'll start thinking, man, maybe I did it wrong. Maybe I should have done it like him. Seems like he's accomplishing more. Seems like she's accomplishing more. We'll look at all these people everywhere, and we start trying to follow all these patterns. Instead of just going back to, wait, 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 God, you promised if I just abide in you, and you abide in me, I'm guaranteed to bear fruit. Are you abiding in Jesus today? So Jesus makes it clear that if I... I invite you to close by reflecting on these six questions drawn from the image of fruitfulness we find in this larger section in Jeremiah, especially the image of the good figs and the bad figs. Figs. So number one, am I abiding so that fruit may grow? Am I abiding? That's the only way that fruit comes. Am I abiding? Second, am I blaming circumstances for fruitlessness? Even though I can truly bear fruit in any circumstance, am I blaming my circumstances for my fruitlessness rather than blaming my lack of abiding? Third, am I trusting in the fruit that is unique to me rather than envying the fruit of others? There is a fruit that God bears through you that is unique to who you are, your talents, your gifts, your experiences. Are you satisfied with that fruit, celebrating that fruit? Or are you envying the fruit that you see in others? Fourth, what pruning is needed so that I might bear even more fruit? Fifth, what fruit am I bearing that blesses those in need, those who are on the margins? It was the lack of fruitfulness toward the poor, the alien, the widow, and others that God was so upset with in Jerusalem. What fruit are you bearing that blesses those in need, those who are on the margin? And six, what thanks can I offer right now for the fruit in my life? You are fruitful. God is bearing fruit through you. So take a moment and give thanks to God for that fruit. Thanks so much for joining me for this abbreviated content from this section in the book of Jeremiah. May God bless you.